Protests during President Biden's visit to Milwaukee this past week upset over his backing of Israel. It's led to a significant number of voters in states like Minnesota and Michigan voting uncommitted as a sign of protest. And right now it's helping fuel the campaign of Jill Stein, the Green Party presidential candidate who campaigned in Madison Racine in Milwaukee this past week. Recently, the State Elections Commission said the Green Party was eligible for the November ballot in Wisconsin. And Jill Stein, who was also on Wisconsin's ballot in 2016, joined us during her stop. What is your lane here in Wisconsin? Who are your voters? Well, it's interesting to see who's showing up, and it's really across the board. For starters, many people are coming who are really impassioned about the genocide that's unfolding on a daily basis before our very eyes on our computer screens. So that, for one, is a big group. And, Democrats? Uh, yes, Demo Democrats for whom uh, genocide is a red line. So we're seeing a lot of people say this is it. We're certainly seeing the um, the Arab American community and likewise the African American community that has also said this system is not serving us. It's time to look for something new. To what you just described and who who is just showing up, if your name is on the ballot here in Wisconsin in November, will you be taking votes away from Joe Biden? Well, as we saw recently, you know, in the Michigan primary, not only did 14% say we have, we have abandoned Biden, so there's a substantial portion within the Democrats who are looking for something else. You think the uncommitted have abandoned the president? Well, that's a term, in fact, that they are using. It's the abandoned Biden movement. Sometimes they call it power vote. But it's essentially people who say, we're not voting for Biden, that Biden has really led us into this genocide. He does not have our vote. And there are many who showed up. But an even bigger demographic are those who refused to even show up for the Democratic primary. And in fact, the turnout was half the numbers that it was in 2020. So that tells you there is now a huge bucket of people who are looking for something to vote for. So we feel it's, it's entirely misleading to say that Greens are taking votes away. No, actually we are giving people an opportunity to vote who otherwise wouldn't be coming out to vote. And who may have otherwise voted Democrat? Well, or who wouldn't vote at all. You told our editorial partner, WisPolitics.com in Madison, that your goal is 5%. Is that your benchmark here well, in Wisconsin? Well, I think that is our bottom line. Your bottom. At 5%, you think you'll do better than you did in 16? We absolutely do. And I wouldn't rule out a complete black swan event in this election. You're going to have four pro-genocide, pro-war, pro-corporate candidates on the ballot, basically splitting that pro-war vote. And that is the Democrat, the Republican, RFK, who is also a very strong supporter of the war in the Middle East, and the No Labels Party, uh, and they probably will run a candidate. So that's four major campaigns that will all be splitting that vote. Former President Donald Trump were to win Wisconsin in the fall. Democrats would blame campaigns like yours if you are on the ballot. Is that fair? Uh, of course not. If you look at the most spoiled election that the Democrats ever had, it was 2010 in the midterms. What happened? Democrats lost 1,000 state rep seats. They lost 64 congressional seats and they lost 13 Senate seats and 12 governorships. There was no third party to blame that on. The blame falls squarely on the shoulders of the Democrats. That election took place after the bailouts for Wall Street and homeowners got thrown out to the tune of millions. People are angry about that. The Democrats have abandoned their base. They have no one to blame but themselves for these so-called spoiled elections. Are you a spoiler? Absolutely not. And I'd say people accuse candidates like me and voters who are clamoring, 63% of voters who are clamoring for another choice. We are not spoilers. Meantime, increasing speculation this weekend. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. saying he'll announce his VP pick next week and former Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers is on the short list. The Kennedy campaign confirming two up front, both Rodgers and former Minnesota governor and pro wrestler Jesse Ventura are at the top of his list. With that, let's bring in Marquette Law School poll director Charles Franklin. Charles, it's always good to see you. Good morning. So let's start with Jill Stein. We just heard from her. Uh, she says that she expects at minimum to get 5% of the vote in November. Uh, is that realistic? That'd be very high. In 2016, when she was on the ballot here, she got 1%, about 30,000 votes. That was more than the margin between Clinton and Trump that year, but it was still far less than the Libertarian candidate got in 2016. So that would be a stretch. Our current polling is showing her around 4%, and we're seeing her take 8% of Democrats' votes when offered the third-party choice. 
also in your latest polling, RFK Jr. is polling at 14% as an independent. Of course, that was before all of this Aaron Rodgers news. Is that number surprising to you? It is surprising for sort of the same reason. Third-party candidates rarely do that well. You have to go back to 1992 when Ross Perot got 19% of the vote nationwide to find an independent scoring even remotely close to double digits. What would Aaron Rodgers as a VP pick for him? What would that do? Well, Rodgers seems to share views about vaccines and vaccination plans with Kennedy. So in that sense, they're compatible. But it's the, the risk of going with the celebrity rather than someone who's ever campaigned for office and ever had to answer reporters' questions again and again and again. And so I think Rogers has answered a lot of reporters' questions, but about a game that he knows everything about. Getting into the political game is like switching from football to playing hockey. The group No Labels this week said that they are for sure going to pursue a unity ticket. How many candidates do you think that we could ultimately end up seeing on a ballot, and what would the impact of that be? It's not terribly unusual for us to see four or five candidates in addition to the two major parties. But the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth of those get very, very few votes. And so it's a question of how prominent those third party candidates can be to attract votes. It's also a matter of how unhappy voters are with the Democratic and Republican nominees. In 2016, when people were very unhappy with Clinton and with Trump, we saw a surge of third party voting that got to five and a half percent. Uh, this year, people are not quite as unhappy with them as they were in 16, though it's still eight months to go. Uh, and so I think there, this position is ripe for discontent with the two major parties to boost third party votes. Always great to have your insight and analysis. Marquette Law School poll director Charles Franklin, good to see you. Thank you. Up next, the new book, The New Insider's account detailing just how far the Trump campaign went to find voter fraud in the days following the 2020 election in states like Wisconsin. The expert they hired is here next.